Worldlink TV presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Welcome to the news of the hour from Abu Dhabi TV. The U.S. State Department condemns the explosion of the Jordanian embassy in Baghdad, which killed 11 people and wounded about 60 others. From Baghdad, our correspondent Adnan Aboud. Adnan Aboud. A massive explosion caused by a vehicle loaded with explosives shook the Jordanian embassy in the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. The explosion, which took place early this morning, killed many Iraqis and wounded a number of others. It also destroyed the front of the embassy building and burned many cars. Jordan describes the explosion as a terrorist act and says that it does not know who is responsible for the attack. Until now, we do not know which group or individuals are behind this cowardly terrorist act. I believe that the terrorist does not have a message. The message of terrorism is bloody. In Baghdad, many U.S. soldiers were wounded during clashes with loyalists to the previous Saddam regime, who threw hand grenades at the U.S. patrol unit. Clashes took place between members of what is called the Temple Mount Group and the Israeli police who were preventing them from entering the sacred grounds of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Our correspondent, Leila Auda from Jerusalem. The Israeli Superior Court responded to the appeal by the Temple Mount Group to allow them to enter the sacred grounds of the Al-Quds Mosque. This did not stop this right-wing extremist group from trying to enter the sacred grounds of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This led to verbal and physical confrontations between a group of right-wing extremists, a group of Arab Jerusalemites, policemen, and Israeli security. An Indonesian court sentences the defendant Amorozi to death. He was the first to be accused of the Bali explosions. This is the end of the News in Brief. Welcome to the news from Abu Dhabi TV. Eleven people were killed and about 60 others were wounded in an explosion that shook the Jordanian embassy compound in the Iraqi capital Baghdad. After the explosion, a number of angry Iraqis entered the embassy and ransacked it. Meanwhile, no one has claimed responsibility for this explosion, which occurred one week after Jordanian King Abdullah agreed to receive Saddam Hussein's two daughters. Now from Baghdad, Adnan Abboud. This is what remains of the Jordanian embassy in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. The building was destroyed. The nearby cars were burned. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a massive explosion this morning, caused by a vehicle loaded with explosives. As a result, parts of the building were destroyed, cars were burned, and passers-by were either killed or wounded. There was an explosion, then cars, pedestrians, embassy guards, and neighboring houses caught on fire. Meanwhile, we heard the sound of American fighter planes. They call them orbit in English, flying over the area. Eyewitnesses' reports on the incident vary. However, some people are linking this explosion to the Jordanian government's decision to grant asylum to Saddam Hussein's two daughters. Nevertheless, others do not agree with this point of view. This is unexpected. There's nothing between us and our Jordanian brothers. What can I tell you? This is unexpected. The United States forces were immediately deployed to the area. They surrounded it, prohibiting people and journalists from entering and refusing to give any statements. This is the first time an Arab embassy has been attacked since the fall of the previous regime. However, this explosion occurred at a time when the country is experiencing a security and political vacuum. The explosion that shook the Jordanian embassy compound in Baghdad ended the relative period of calm in the Iraqi capital. This may be a warning sign of more danger to come. Adnan Abboud, Abu Dhabi Television, near the Jordanian embassy, Baghdad. The normalization of Arab relations with Israel has become an important topic. Attention was focused on a recent meeting that took place between the Moroccan and Israeli foreign ministers. 
Normalization between Arab states and Israel was supposed to be the final stage of the roadmap, but some Arab countries are already satisfied by what Israel has done so far, and thus they are holding meetings with Israeli officials to resume political relations. <laughs> لم يعد كفرا في السياسة العربية ذكر اسم إسرائيل بل أصبح It is no longer a sin for Arab politicians to mention Israel To the contrary, mentioning Israel is a good thing to do because that improves their standing with the United States something many Arab countries use to promote their internal status Israel is no longer the phantom country unrecognized by Arab regimes It is also no longer the state that was ignored on Arab maps now, Israel is the center of fire and light. Countries that get closer to it may get burned, and those that distance themselves from it live in darkness away from the United States' support. Five countries ignored the political taboo against Israel. Some of them, such as Egypt, Mauritania, and Jordan, establish direct relations with the Hebrew state. Others do not mind establishing relations with it, even if they already established positive ties with the United States based on issues other than Israel. We will only mention Morocco and Qatar. Arab relations with Israel have never been better than today. Although the number of Arab countries that have ties with Israel has not increased, the willingness to do so has never been as prevalent as we see it today. Normalization with Israel is no longer a problem to Arab countries. However, the Israeli treatment to the Palestinians on the ground makes many of them rethink the idea a thousand times over before establishing relations with this country or improving already established ones. Egypt and Jordan froze their relations with Israel. Tunisia, Oman, and Morocco halted their contacts with it after the Second Intifada, which was faced with extreme brutality at the hands of the Israelis. Many Arab countries did not normalize their relations with Israel, largely because they feared local opposition groups who refused such a move so long as Israel continues its brutality and cruelty against the Palestinians. These opposition groups, who tend to be Islamic organizations, embarrassed many Arab officials who led campaigns to improve Arab relations with the United States through normalization with Israel. Israel. Thus, the relations of Arab countries with the United States are largely influenced by their ties to Israel. Nonetheless, there is no room for normalization with Israel among confrontational countries like Syria and Lebanon. Many political analysts say that lengthy negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, which have lasted for 10 years, destroy the largest obstacle that impeded normalization. Today, the belief that normalization with Israel is a crime or betrayal, which dominated many Arab officials for many years, is gone. The Israeli release of Palestinians to be freed anyhow, sooner or later on one hand, and the alleged U.S. pressure on Israel to reconsider the path of the Israeli security fence prove no more than media stuff to lull the Palestinians. This joint U.S.-Israeli maneuver comes as a prelude to the expected visit by U.S. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice to the region, another alleged show of push in the roadmap. When asked just moments after being released how he felt to have regained his freedom, one of the Palestinian prisoners said Wednesday, Freedom, don't you read the newspapers? As far as I know, there will still be many walls around me. This was a direct reference to the security fence Israel is constructing to separate the West Bank from territories occupied since 1948. On Wednesday, the United States made a wide propaganda that is seeking through dialogue to persuade Israel to stop constructing defense. We're, we're talking to Israel about all aspects of defense. I made it clear I thought defense was a problem. And, uh, and so we're talking with them and we'll continue to work on this issue as well as other issues. I do believe we're making progress. 
The U.S. further alleged it considered financial sanctions against Israel. The U.S. State Department said a proposal under discussion would withhold U.S. loan guarantees to the amount Israel spends on sections of the barrier it builds on Palestinian territories. But giving way to any changes in the future, the White House spokesman emphasized that no decision had been taken yet. According to Palestinian analysts, none of these statements are really influential. I start from the very end. The construction of the separation wall will not stop. If the Zionist entity knew that it would be subject to true pressure to stop building the wall, it would not have started building it. There is an agreement on central issues between the Israeli entity and the Americans. Rice will deal with three crises. First, the crisis of the Zionist government. It has proven that the truce has been very beneficiary economically for the Zionists. Consequently, she will try to tell them, the truce served you a lot. Why don't you maneuver a little as far as the war is concerned? The second crisis is that of the American government which wants something to happen in the Palestinian territories because its own economic situation is not improving and it's facing another crisis in Iraq. The U.S. is also dealing with the Palestinian crisis. In fact, Abu Mazen and Arafat are in big trouble with the Palestinian public. Nothing is achieved so far, and Rice's visit is aimed at giving a push to the statue quo. Such analysis gains more weight recalling what Israelis openly announce. Sharon overtly stated Israel will not give the Palestinians anything. A U.S. occupation military spokesman said Thursday that two American soldiers were killed Wednesday night in the Rashid suburb near the Iraqi capital without giving further details. A car bomb killed at least 11 people and injured more than 57 others when it exploded Thursday outside Jordan's embassy in Baghdad. The explosion caused massive damage to the embassy's facade and bodies were seen spread on the perimeter of the blown car. Injured employees were also seen leaving the embassy covered with blood. Primary investigations concluded that a bomb was planted in a car in the Mansour area in Baghdad in front of the Jordanian embassy's main gate. Most of the dead people were identified to be Iraqi security men guarding the embassy. However, it was not clear whether the explosion targeted Jordan's embassy in Iraq or not. Our correspondent in Jordan said that official sources confirmed there were no deaths among its Jordanian employees, but there were some 15 injuries, particularly among receptionists. And official sources did not comment on the bombing until further investigations shed more light on the circumstances of the bombing. Iraqis, meanwhile, stormed the gate of the embassy and began smashing portraits of Jordan's King Abdullah II and his late father, King Hussein, while chanting anti-Jordanian slogans. Tensions between the neighboring countries have been high due to Jordan's support for the U.S.-led war on Iraq. A Jordanian government spokesman later described the explosion outside his country's embassy in Baghdad as a cowardly terrorist act. A massive explosion at the Jordanian embassy in Baghdad has left at least 11 people dead and dozens injured, including five Jordanian nationals. Jordan condemned the attack as an act of terror and cowardice and vowed not to relent in the fight against terror. Minister of Information Dr. Nabil Sharif said the bombing would not deter Jordan from extending further assistance to Iraqis and carrying out its commitment to the restoration of peace and security to war-torn Iraq. Uh, Jordan condemns in the strongest terms the terrorist uh, act that took place uh, today in the uh, Jordanian embassy in Baghdad and uh, we think that this cowardly terrorist uh, act uh, uh, is uh, aimed at uh, uh, deviating Jordan from its path of support uh, for Iraq, and this is not going to happen. We will continue our support for the brotherly Iraqi people. 
A foreign ministry source here in Amman said the Baghdad embassy was the target of a terror attack which occurred at 10.30 this morning and left a number of innocent Iraqis dead. It said five embassy staff only suffered medium to minor injuries, but they were in stable condition and none of the Jordanian nationals inside the building were killed. It said the embassy compound suffered severe damage. The source said the government of Jordan was holding contacts with all parties, namely the United States, on the investigation into the blast to uncover the vicious hands that perpetrated this terrorist act attack. U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell called Foreign Minister Marwan Nasher to express his condemnation. Nasher asked for protection of the diplomatic mission and its staff and demanded a full investigation to reveal the culprits. In the phone call, Powell pledged that the U.S. would provide protection to the embassy. United Nations Special Envoy in Iraq, Sergio De Meo, also telephoned Nasher to denounce the attack and express his solidarity and help. The foreign ministry source said the attack would neither succeed to undermine the historic ties between the Jordanian and the Iraqi peoples, nor force Jordan to back off its endeavors to preserve Iraq's territorial unity and help Iraqis determine their future. The source said a Jordanian field hospital would continue to carry out its humanitarian task in the town of Fallujah. The statement added that for the past decades, Jordan had been the target of terrorist attacks, but had warded them all off and struck with an iron fist at those seeking to undermine its security and interests. The House of Representatives also condemned the blast at the Jordanian embassy in Baghdad and said it would not dissuade Jordan from supporting Iraqis to end the U.S. occupation and build their future in a free, united and democratic Iraq. The governing council in Iraq also condemned the embassy blast and said it would not affect the good relations between Jordan and Iraq. The powerful truck bomb outside the Jordanian embassy compound killed 11 people, wounded 65, and left burned out cars and shattered glass scattered nearby. The motive for the attack was not immediately clear and no group has claimed responsibility. The senior U.S. general in Iraq called it the work of professional terrorists. An Iraqi police captain said that four civilians at the scene among, were among the dead and were killed in a car caught in the blast. The vehicle that police said had carried the bomb was reduced to charred wreckage. Body parts were strewn about a wide area and windows within 500 meters were blown out. U.S. soldiers in tanks and Humvee vehicles arrived at the scene to investigate the blast. They cordoned off the area and brought the chief of Iraqi police to help with inquiries. Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, the U.S. commander in Iraq, said that in terms of casualties, it was the worst attack on a non-military target since the end of major combat. They've just brought out another wounded man. In continuing attacks on U.S. troops, one Iraqi was killed in a firefight with U.S. troops in Baghdad after Iraqi guerrillas fired a rocket-propelled grenade that set ablaze a U.S. military vehicle. U.S. soldiers opened fire after the attack, killing the man who appeared to be a bystander. Witnesses said the Humvee was driving near the Palm Hotel when guerrillas fired the grenade. Four soldiers were inside the vehicle when it was hit and they suffered serious wounds. Last night, two U.S. soldiers were killed and one was wounded, along with an Iraqi interpreter, in a gun battle in Baghdad. And as the hunt for Saddam Hussein goes on, U.S. military officials said the ousted Iraqi leader was moving around frequently to elude capture. The general searching for him around his hometown, Tikrit, said Saddam was moving every few hours, probably in disguise and aided by members of his clan. Major General Ray Oderno, the commander of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, said he could not be certain how close his troops had come to capturing Saddam or or that he was definitely in the area, but he had regular intelligence that he was. U.S. forces seized three guerrilla leaders in raids last night. A set of Saddam Hussein's thumbprints sent to a British foundry that helped make his triumphal arc could hold the key to his detection. The Morris Singer foundry in Hampshire helped to build the ceremonial triumphal arc in Baghdad in 1986. Morris Singer helped cast the monument's huge hands.
Russia and the United States reaffirmed on Thursday their opposition to Israel's decision to proceed with construction of the so-called security fence in the West Bank. Wrapping up a two-day of talks in Moscow before heading off on a key Middle East regional tour, U.S. Assistant uh, Secretary of State for Near East Affairs, William Burns, had conferred with Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Yuri Fudotov. During their meeting, Burns and Fudotov had discussed ways to advance a fragile peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. The senior U.S. envoy reaffirmed the U.S. administration's concern about Israel's building the massive fence between its territory and the West Bank. For his part, Fototov said that Moscow and Washington share concerns about the Israeli fence. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell on Thursday renewed U.S. concerns about Israel's barrier, but said that no decision had yet been whether the, to penalize Israel for its construction. Powell said that Washington remained worried that the barrier would complicate the delineation of the borders for a Palestinian state. Israel claims, however, the fence is a security measure intended to keep out self-sacrifice bombers, while the Palestinians angrily protest the barrier, saying that it encroaches unacceptably on the West Bank land. Palestinian President Yasser Arafat said on Thursday that Israel's latest release of prisoners was not sufficient and asked for all prisoners to be released. Arafat congratulated the 334 released prisoners, but said there were thousands of other prisoners and every day Israel arrested dozens more. He also spoke about Al-Haram al-Sharif issue, stressing that Israel must understand the site is the third holiest site for Muslims, the place where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ascended to heaven. Earlier on Thursday, Israeli police had prevented a few dozen ultranationalist Jews from entering the holy site, fearing the visit could touch off violence. The holy place has been closed to non-Muslims during nearly three years of violence, which started on September the 28th, the year 2000, when Ariel Sharon, who was then an opposition leader in parliament, had toured this site. And on the ground, the Israeli army arrested eight Palestinians early on Thursday and overnight, among them three local leaders of the Jihad resistance group. Military sources said that three activists and a fourth unidentified man were apprehended when the army stopped their car at a military roadblock south of the northern West Bank city of Jenin. The sources added that two members of the Hamas resistance group were arrested in Tolkarm, while young women and an activist from the Fatah movement were arrested near Ramallah. In a separate incident, three men executed a Palestinian man in Ramallah on Thursday after accusing him of being a collaborator. The three said they were from Al-Aqsa Mata's brigades, an offshoot of the Fatah movement. And as West African peacekeepers began patrolling the war-battered capital, Monrovia, Liberian President Charles Taylor had announced on Thursday that he would resign next Monday, handing over power to his vice president. Taylor told CNN that he had met the provisions of the Constitution of Liberia and that the vice president would be sworn in. Meanwhile, an emergency session of the Liberian parliament endorsed the president's decision to step down on Monday and hand over power to Blanc. Taylor did not address the emergency parliament session, but his spokesman underlined that the president would hand over power as promised to West African mediators. However, skepticism abounded over whether Taylor would keep to his word as he seeks to duck war crimes charges for his role in neighboring Sierra Leone. Meanwhile, the commander of the West African Peacekeeping Force said the troops were coming into town from Monrovia's Roberts Field International Airport. He said the force would start patrols in the rebel-held northern area next week. An Indonesian court on Thursday sentenced to death a key player in last year's Bali nightclub bombings. Amrozi bin Nur Hashim was found guilty of planning and helping execute the bombings that killed 202 people. The verdict came just two days after a car bomb killed 10 people at a hotel in the capital Jakarta and coincided with concern that a shadowy Southeast Asian network linked to Al-Qaeda might be plotting further strikes. After the sentence was announced, a defiant Ambrosi swiveled his chair to the courtroom to face victims as well as relatives of those killed. Ambrosi's lawyer said that his client would appeal on the grounds that his only contribution to the world's worst act of terror since the September 11th attacks was to supply a van and chemicals for the car bomb that destroyed one of the two nightclubs.
got the compassion of the merciful. Hello and thanks for joining us with this edition of Jenna News brought to you live from Tehran. Iran on Thursday dismissed a report by Riyadh-based Al-Batan Devi concerning an alleged letter written by President Mohammad Khatami to the U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. Foreign Ministry spokesman Hamid Reza Safi made it clear that Tehran is not for clandestine ties with any country and has always based its foreign relations on national interests, lawful decisions and transparency. Commenting on certain appeals for Tehran's guaranteeing a crackdown on Al-Qaeda network, Asafi reiterated, needless of comments from others, Tehran will press ahead with its getting tough policy on the terrorist groups. Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman then termed as unreal the claims by the American Daily Los Angeles Times on Iran's alleged efforts to produce nuclear weapons, saying, the report in question has been forced to launch the propaganda blitz on the Islamic Republic of Iran. Asafi emphasized that Tehran considers any drive to produce weapons of mass destruction as inhumane and immoral. From Kabul to Baghdad, a journey which set off 18 months ago with the U.S. flag of freedom. Now, with the rules of the game an open secret, Iraqis and Afghans see no light sparking on the bumpy road ahead, as promises by the U.S. to rebuild the countries from scratch have remained in words, not action. Almost one and a half years on since the ouster of the Taliban, many Afghans still seek employment in Tehran. Afghans headed back home after the fall of the Taliban, but their stay was short-lived, and many slipped back across the border into Iran. Security and employment. I will face serious difficulties running my family life if I go back to an Afghan refugee residing in Iran. The UN admits the reconstruction in the war shattered country is very slow paced. Despite the regime change in neighboring Afghanistan, there are still large numbers of Afghans living and working here in Iran. To the West, a similar story is in the making. The story which began with the alleged direct weapons of mass destruction and entered the new stage with the downfall of Saddam. No such weapon has yet been found in the country. Even before the U.S.-led invasion of Afghanistan, the country was dotted with the scars of war. I'm not certain that you can compare Iraq and Afghanistan. These were two very different countries to start with. Uh, the infrastructure wasn't the same, the, the, the economy isn't the same. During the Iraq war, Western companies were quick to seal oil deals in the name of reconstructing the country. Under the Geneva Convention, belligerent forces are not entitled to rebuild the target country. Despite promises by the international community at the Tokyo conference to make contributions to reconstruction efforts, no sign of change in the war torn Afghanistan yet. Two different scenarios with the same nature, with anti-U.S. sentiments on the rise in Iraq and even throughout the world. The American ruler, Paul Bremer, has even a tougher road ahead now that the Afghan experience proved fatal. Say to Kirin, Tehran. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, 